itself. So while while um, you know we switch the uh, uh, the microphone, I'm yes. introducing uh, Peter Dittrich for you, who is at the University in Jena. Uh, we've known each other for quite a while, but it was also fun, uh, you know, his funding is from the uh, German, uh, you know, equivalent of the NSF. They have a different way of doing funding. They get basically get the reviewers to sit in a room and the uh, applicants to actually defend, you know, their research projects, and I was one of the reviewers, but apparently he got the money, so, you know, he can actually uh, <laughs> show you what, what kind of work uh, they have been doing. And I have to tell you, the program they have in Germany, you know, it was really very much focused on exactly these topics, you know, coding, information theory, and so on, applied to biological systems. P perhaps, you know, exactly what the NSF wants to do now, but the DFG has actually been doing that now for six years, so, so, so you know, maybe a little bit of a head. All right, go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. So, in this talk, I would like to present you our work on molecular codes. So we had tried to use them to measure semantics, capacity of physical media in general. And here in this talk, by code, I mean the meaning from, from genetic code, that is a mapping that goes from some set to another set, so as in genetic code. So the talk will be related to sign-mediated communication. So in particular, as we have heard, the meaning of chemicals. So how can we now discuss um, so, so I want to show you some kind of technique, how to evaluate the semantic capacity of a physical media that is related to, let's say, meaningful semantic information. So the aim now is to introduce a novel scientific instrument to classify different chemical systems. And uh, this instrument measures the ability of a chemistry to implement so-called contingent mappings. That means arbitrary mappings. And the mapping is called contingent if a different mapping from the same domain to the same codomain can be implemented by the same chemistry. And in this sense, a contingent mapping is arbitrary. That is, it cannot be inferred from the elements of the domain and codomain alone, just using physical laws. And why is that interesting? I mean, it has been mentioned, of course, way before, that a contingent mapping uh, have been described as very important in the context of biological uh, signaling coding. This beautiful book by Jacques Monod, for example, you, you can find it. And one paper that inspired me very happily from Marcello Barbieri on biosemiotics. Where you, can, you can find it in many ways where this is described, this effect. And basically, the technique I show you now is operation, operationally, I mean, putting this in a formal base, and you can then apply it to data. Yeah? So the motivation was to distinguish chemical molecules that are sign, um, semantic carrying information from those that are not. For example, the difference between a flame eating sugar yeah, and a living organism eating sugar. So what's the difference? Both are chemical reactions. What is the difference? Or if you see a molecule that goes to a cell and then the cell dies, was it a signal telling the cell to die? die? Or was it just some stuff that you get in the bathroom that kills everything? Yeah? So, so, what, what, uh, so how can you distinguish these two things? And uh, so the basic idea is now to introduce this concept of the molecular code. So the molecular code, what is it? So the molecular code is defined formally with respect to some kind of chemistry, physical medium, that's a, the world, yeah, the physical world. So with respect to some physical world or chemistry, we define what a molecular code is. And uh, it's a mapping between molecules, like in the genetic code, that can be realized by other molecules. And now the second very important property, because you can find a lot of mappings in physics. Yeah? I can touch it, and it moves. Yeah? So there's a mapping. So, but this mapping that I'm talking about now should have a second property that uh, has been discussed, that is, it is contingent. That is, the mapping can be different by changing the molecules realizing it. And, uh, I now try to make it more explicit by not presenting the mathematical definition in detail, but trying to illustrate the mathematical definition by referring to example. So now first describing the world, yeah, the chemistry, and the chemistry here is very simple. There are just eight molecular species, and they, the, 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 the interaction between the molecular species are described by reactions. So here's an example of a reaction. You have a species A1 plus an enzyme E1 converts the species A1 to a species B1, and the enzyme is not changed. So here you see this reaction. Okay, so now the whole world consists just of four chemical reactions among these 
eight species. And you see here, for example, A2 is converted to B2 by E2, A1 by E3 to B2, and A2 converted by E4 to B1. Yeah, that's the whole world, yeah, let's say. Not nothing, of course, reality is different uh, to that. Um, okay, so now, so now we describe, describe what, the, what is a molecular code. So we need these two properties. The first one, it should be, real, it should be realizable by this kind of chemistry. Let's look at that first. How does it work? So in this case, now we want to realize a mapping from this set of molecules to that set of molecules. So these are these two molecules. We want to map to these two molecules. So how can we do this now? So we have to find a set of molecules that uh, I just call the context C. Yeah? And in this example, the context C is simply these two molecular species here. And uh, OK, these are the molecular species. Now, how can we now implement with these molecular species the mapping? So we just take these two molecular species, put them in a chemical reactor. We throw in one of those molecules yeah, and let them react until nothing can be created anymore. That's called the closure. And uh, so in this case, we have created B1. And, that, and there's no B2. So, so basically, the chemical system has computed the mapping from A1 to B1. Basically, this mapping has been computed. And we can do the same, of course. Again, we take the same context. We throw in the molecule A2, let it react. And at some point, it generates B2 and not B1. So the chemical system has computed, if you want, the mapping from A2 to B2. So now this is now how to implement a mapping by a chemical system. Now the next step we have to check is this contingent, is the second property. So the second property now means that an alternative mapping on the same domain, the same co-domain can be realized uh, by uh, changing the context. Yeah? And I show you, of course, how does it work. So now we have to find an alternative context C prime. And in this case, of course, the alternative context consists of E3 and E4. So that's the alternative context. And now, of course, you see that if we now throw in A1, yeah, we get B2. If we throw in A2, we get B1. So basically, now, this context now generates a different mapping on the same domain and the same co-domain than we had before with this context. This context was creating a, map, a different mapping before. So it's contingent. So basically, this mapping then can be implemented and is contingent. We call it a molecular code. So maybe just to show you that not all mappings are contingent, here's another mapping that goes from E1 to B1 and E3 to B2. And it's possible to implement that mapping. So you see, we can use this context here. And this mapping is then implemented by that context, obviously, because we can now react this one reacts to this one, E3 to this one, giving this molecule. But this is not contingent. Uh, you, you cannot change the context and change the mapping. So basically, there's a physical, uh, let's say, law that takes you from this set to that set, and the context does not matter at all. Now, OK, so that's the basic idea that can be put in a formula. And of course, we can make now a software that finds these molecular codes in chemical reaction networks. So the software. It takes a lot of computational amount. It's very difficult to find them. The complexity is quite large. It's not exponential, but it's quite large. So you can analyze systems of, let's say, 100, if you're lucky, 1,000 molecules, but let's say 100, 100 molecules. And oh, wow. <laughs> OK, and we just now, you can now plug in a reaction network. And you can, with the software, you can find all molecular codes that this network can realize. And we call the number of these molecular codes, we call it semantic capacity. So the more molecular codes a network can realize, the more higher the semantic capacity in principle is. So now some results on real and non-real networks, preliminary because the data is not very strong. So please be careful by conclusions drawn from that. So of course, when we look at translation and the chemistry behind the translation thing, or then of course you have here this set of molecular species that are these triplets, if you like. Then you have the amino acids. And of course, the mapping, the genetic code mapping, the classical one, there's some kind of chemistry involved that is doing this kind of mapping. And when you now build the whole network of all these possibilities of all possible transfer RNAs, of course, there are also other alternatives that do other kind of mappings. And obviously, you can generate a lot of molecular codes here. I mean, that is clear. You can also calculate this. 
And now looking at gene regulatory networks, you also have seen today a very nice talk showing how you can there change the relationship in gene regulatory networks. I will not go into detail, but you can imagine it's very easy to change the, uh, the, 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 the mapping. And so we have a very high number of molecular codes. It's very easy to make uh, uh, alternative mappings by because, okay, I don't go into details. Now signal transaction networks. You can now just look at one step of this phosphorylation cycle. So if a uh, kinase that phosphorylates something, this mapping is, uh, is a mapping, but it's of course not a code because there's a physical uh, relation between these two things and you cannot change it yeah, by some context changing, at least uh, roughly. Yeah? But when you make two steps, in this cascade, then you get an arbitrary relationship, a contingent relation between here and here, because you can choose this one to, or this one to express, and you have a molecular code in a longer cascade. We also looked at metabolic networks. When you look at metabolic networks, we find uh, some, but not much, v very tiny amount of codes. Here's an example, and uh, they are also very strange. I, uh, okay, now let's go to Mars. And look at the photochemistry of Mars. We took a model here from this book that has 31 species and 100 reactions. And it looks like this. Yeah. Uh, so these are 100 reactions. And now we, found, we tried to find, or we, we computed all molecular codes inside this network. And there are actually none. So there's not a single pattern of the site that I showed you before. There, so there's no way to make a contingent mapping as I showed it before. And uh, we also looked at combustion chemistries. And you see here the size of the combustion chemistries. And uh, so let's say 80 reactions, 700, uh, 700 reactions. And also in these combustion chemistries, not a single pattern that allows you this uh, contingent mapping. Yeah? And so we, in a way you can now say that the semantic capacity is very high here in gene regulation, medium high in signal transduction, low in metabolic networks, and these unorganic chemistry is very low, at least as we saw it. So this can now go to a hypothesis that on the, over the course of prebiotic and biotic evolution of life, the semantic capacity of the chemistry that is incorporated by life, that life can access, tends to increase. Yeah? And of course, it goes beyond the molecular level now, as we have seen. And okay, so now, and, and this is of course measurable, so we can measure it and we can reconstruct, I mean, we can re it's really quantifiable. So, of course, the approach generalizes to different media. It's not necessarily a molecule level. And just to show this, you can also do this in cellular automata, where you say, okay, I have a sign at a meaning cell, some context, and then you can measure which cellular automata can implement contingent mappings and which one not. And for example, one result of that was that there's not a trivial relation between contingency and its complexity. So there are complex automata that have a lot of arbitrary mappings, but there are also simple automata that can imply these contingent mappings. And also, oh well, I'm in time, I think. <laughs> Maybe it was too fast. So also Chris introduced the negative information when you have three things, yeah? And actually, uh, you have, of course, a very high contingency in the exclusive R. And actually, you can find an exercise in your book where I learned all this. <laughs> okay, and um, so actually what you can do, you can now measure the, um, you can use, you use the, the, okay, you use the multivariate mutual information as shown here. And it's between the, 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 the sign, the, the, the meaning, and the context. And then uh, you can now think about that maybe if you have a negative one, then you have a certain amount of contingency. And it works in particular situations, but I can also tell you that there are also situations where it does not work if the context is huge, if there are a huge amount of possibilities of, of the context, there's not a trivial relationship. So what has to be done in the future? What has to be next? More data. We have to look at more networks, more systems to, to study this kind of things, the relations. The second thing is that it was quite arbitrary what we have selected as a signal. So what was a signal? What is the meaning? We just took the presence of a molecule. So the presence of a species or not being present, we took as a signal. Yeah? But of course, life, living systems, what are they taking as signals? And we have to add the pragmatic aspect of information to that to distinguish what is a signal, maybe evolution also. Yeah? 
And the last thing that I showed you that we can use this information theoretic means to quantify the level of contingency that worked a little bit, but there were problems, and we have to more do more on that and use information. So the conclusion is semantic capacity, as it, I described it here, is this arbitrariness inspired by this other work I showed, can be measured and differs uh, in different physical media. So we can distinguish now different chemistries, different physical media by their semantic capacity. And identifying the mechanism of how the contingency is realized by a biolog biological system, so for example, I could imagine, I, I, of course I don't know calcium signaling, but what are then now the mechanisms, how living systems are now getting access to contingent relationships can then shed light to additional additional light on sign-mediated biological information processing and communication. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> it's <like> a commercial. <laughs> All right, before we go to dinner, we might have a few questions. Um, first one in the back, back over there. So he mentioned an exercise in my book, that's <laughs> yes. the 98 book. Uh, yes. There are plenty more exercises in my new book, which will come out uh, hopefully at the end of this year. <laughs> which is called Evolution of Biological Information and Complexity. Do I, do I have homework? Um, no, anyway, so uh, I'll do them both. Um, so, 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 but the, uh, the question I have is, um, so, so in, the, in the example you had with like A1 and, and, and B1, the, the first example, um, that one, yeah. So it, it seems like um, uh, uh, one critical thing here is that you have kind of a time scale that's inherent here because at equilibrium, the mm. amount of uh, B1 and B2 is going to be fully determined by the free energies. Mm. So um, uh, uh, not the presence of the context. Mm. So I'm just curious, this is sort of a two-part question. I don't think it matters, but does it at all? And, and two, is there a way to modify this so that it's really, say, the ratio of B1 to B2 in terms of, of that's the mapping, right? Or something mm. like that, uh, where, where you have... Rather than just it all has to go to B1 and nothing to B2, is it possible to modify yes. it to kind of have that kind of quantitative aspect? Yeah. So first, of course, we took, let's say, the simplest approach by using here the, um, let's say, just the algebraic closure on the set of species, everything that can happen, and then is it there or is it not there? That is, of course, very simple. And we can now extend this to dynamical features. So, for example, using also the self-maintenance of the system organization theory we could apply would be possible. And, of course, I also think it will generalize now to, let's say, concentration levels. But it has not been done at all. Yes. Here uh, in the back. Uh, here in the back. So I was wondering if you generate uh, random sets of symbols and random mappings, if there's some sort of um, phase transition at which the number of links or whatever becomes yes. contingent or becomes highly mm. semantic or what was the word you use? Uh, yes. High content of meanings or something like that. Okay. So I hope. Okay. I try to remember. We, we tried that. And so you generate a random network. So we, let's say a network where you have two uh, second order reactions. So two reactants, one product. And you generate a random network. And at the order of uh, the density should be uh, two times the number of molecules. You have the highest number of molecular codes. In the random network, you get, in this sense, more molecular codes than in these uh, chemistries from Mars and combustion. So if you would randomize these, molecule, these, uh, these systems, you would get more molecular codes. Interesting. So it's not, this molecular code thing is not a thing that it has to be really complicated. But you get them also in random networks when the number of reactions is about two times the number of species in second order reactions. Um, thank you. I study animal behavior, so this may be a really naive question, mm. but I'm just trying to understand. So do the data that Werner presented this morning showing a potential correlation between the, gen the nucleotide code and the chemical properties of the amino acids that they code for, does that challenge the contingent nature of the so genetic code? So again, I have to understand. You know what I'm saying? I mean, shouldn't there be no correlation? Sorry? Shouldn't in a contingent code or in an arbitrary code... Shouldn't there be no relationship between the nucleotides of the, amino, of the universal genetic code and the chemical properties of the amino acids they code for? Okay, so you, you are referring to that the genetic code is not just arbitrarily chosen and then frozen, right? 
but I mean, there's that a lot there's of a relation, there's an actual physical relationship yeah, yeah, of between the nucleotides of and the chemical yeah, yeah. properties of the yes. amino acids. I mean, that, that is clear. Right. I mean, in the genetic code, of course, there's a lot of structure and physical link between uh, the codons. And, and the amino acids. Yes. Right. Yes, yes. So does that not challenge the arbitrary nature of the code? Okay. That is challenging a little bit that I was saying about quantifying the contingency. So th there's a certain, uh, so you can now say, okay, how, how likely is it to have this particular type of mapping? Mm -hmm. And maybe it would not be 100% sure that we would get this again mm -hmm. when we now rerun the evolution again. So maybe it will be exactly the same. But then, of course, there's also some codes are more useful than other codes. So, so that does not, yeah. Mm. Okay, so there's sort of maybe a continuum of arbitrariness? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Cool. Okay. I've got kind of a miss the boat sort of question. Um, so you've got this bipartite, looking there, you have a bipartite mapping between A and B, right? Yes. Okay. Um, so as the number of things on each side grows, the number of uh, <laughs> links that you need goes as n mm. square. Yeah, so yeah. So that's the first thing. Yes. Then you mentioned generalization to large numbers of chemicals. Are you actually building or, or positing chemical networks that way, or mm. is this a graph theory problem? So first, you are right. When the sets get larger, we get a problem, because then the number of mappings that you get increases. If you have, I thought it's easy. I thought it's just, just a sub-problem, but it's not. So I think it's still pr an open problem, how, what to do when the sets go much larger. And you're asking whether we are probing larger networks or I'm the second question. The chemistry is real or you're okay, so in, this, in the metabolic network case, it was real chemistry. And also in the uh, atmosphere chemistry and the combustion was also real chemistry. So these are real networks, real models. And the advantage of the combustion chemistry and atmosphere chemistry networks is that they are complete in a way, so that they try to find really all the reactions that are going on inside and that matter. So in this sense, because to identify something to be a molecular code, you need the alternative reactions that could happen if you would change the context. And that's why we have chosen those. And these are real networks, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's uh, thank again our last speaker. Thank you very much. <laughs>